Welcome to the lesson on the resonating air column that is open at one end and closed at the other. This is the second lesson in the um, Standing Waves and in Instruments series. And we're going to start off by taking a look at um, a neat little demonstration that's often done. Uh, it's even been referred to in the free response packet. And we're going to watch that and then we'll come back to these diagrams. Okay, so well, we've uh, got the speed of sound lab set up here. We've got a tuning fork which we've just struck and it's vibrating at 5 hertz. And what we're going to do is change the height in this column. Um, as we do this, when the column corresponds to the frequency of the tuning fork, you'll hear resonance like we just heard as it passed through that point. Here we'll try this again going in the other direction. So there you can hear that at a certain volume of air in the column, we get a resonance frequency that uh, basically amplifies the sound based on the frequency. Now we're going to change to a different frequency, 320 hertz. And we can repeat the experiment. The water drops. You could hear the resonance as the um, height of the column reached about 26 centimeters. And we'll try it again going the other way just to show that off again. So there you go, you can hear a marked increase in the volume. So, based on the height of the column, where you get the resonance frequency, um, and the, free, the known frequency, which we derived from the actual marked value on the tuning fork, we're able to do a calculation of the speed of sound. We'll leave that to you. Thanks. Pretty neat demonstration on how the air column open at one end and closed at the other can be used to calculate the speed of sound, and there will be more discussion on how to do that in class. A reminder here as we get started um, that Standing waves are what are created in these air columns and strings to produce the notes. And we're going to draw a standing wave here just to use as a reference. This is, of course, the equilibrium position. And the thing to note with the air column that's open in one end and closed at the other, like this uh, toy train whistle, uh, is that whenever you have a closed end that you get um, it acts as a fixed end and you can only get a node at that location so if we start to take a look at this for the fundamental frequency f1 we know the length of the air column is from the opening to the end of the air column itself so we'll mark that length L, that's the length of the air column, and we know that a node has to be placed at that spot at the right end because that end is closed and, you keep, and that's where the standing wave is going to reflect and invert off of. However, we don't have a closed end on the other end, therefore we can't have a node. So looking up at our drawing, our standing wave drawing, what's the smallest part of a standing wave that meets that requirement? Where you have a node on the end, but you can't have a node on the other end. Well, if you examine closely, what that means is we would have a node on the right end and the middle of an anti-node at the hole. So we have the middle of an anti-node, flips and inverts, and comes back. The question is, how much of a standing wave is that? Well, in length L, that would be one fourth of the standing wave. So now let's look at the relationships among the wave variables at the fundamental frequency. 
we have v equals f1 lambda. The wavelength would be, in terms of L, 4 times L. Multiply both sides by 4. So V equals F1 times 4L. Now let's look at the second harmonic for the air column open at one end and closed at the other. We still have to have a node here on the right end, the closed end. We still can only have the middle of an antinode at the hole. So what's the next largest portion of that standing wave that can fit and meet that requirement? And of course, that would be at this location here, drawn in the standing wave diagram. And where would that be? Where would the next node be? Um, inside the air column. Well, it makes sense that it would be two-thirds, uh, two-thirds away from the right end. So we basically eyeball here and put a node two-thirds from the right end. We would go from having an anti-node And then a crest that inverts and becomes the trough here. How much of a standing wave is this? This is three quarters of a standing wave. Solving for lambda, we get four thirds L. Now analyzing the variables at the second harmonic, V equals F2 lambda. V then would be F2 times 4 thirds. L. Now what's the relationship between F2 and F1? We could set the F1 equation and the F2 equation equal to each other and solve for F2 in terms of F1. And you can see that F2 would be equal to 3F1. And again, if you don't understand where these calculations are coming from, make sure you ask in class. The third harmonic, what would that look like inside the air column? We still have to have a node here. And I think you're catching on that now we would have to have two anti-nodes uh, in, in between the hole and the fixed end on the right side. Well, that means we would have to divide our air column up into fifths. And if you do that, you kind of approximate here. You would get a crest that becomes a trough. That becomes a crest, flip, trough, crest, trough. And that's what it would look like inside the air column. How much of a standing wave is that? Well, that's a whole one plus another quarter. Written as a fraction, that would be five quarters lambda. And so the wavelength would be four fifths of the air column whose length is L. Analyzing the data for the third harmonic, V equals F3 lambda. V equals F3 times 4 fifths L. When we compare that to the fundamental frequency, we see that F3 in terms of the fundamental frequency would be 5F1. So the second harmonic would be 3 times the fundamental frequency, and the third harmonic would be 5 times the fundamental frequency. All right, that'll do it for the resonance, the resonating air column open at one end and closed at the other. 
and still to come is the resonating air column that is open at both ends.